Okay, so um, let's make a start. It's two o'clock. Um, so thank you very much for showing up to this Northwest um, Mathematics, uh, Biomathematics seminar series. And today we're really pleased to have the seminar by Angela Relogio and Janina Hesse, uh, who are in at Charité in Ber uh, Berlin. And they'll be telling us about circadian clocks and um, models of these in humans. So I'm really looking forward to this and Angela and Janina, if you wanna take over, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Can I click here in this thing that I see in my screen? Should I press continue? Yeah, I think you possibly. <laughs> okay, so now it's hot. Yeah. So my name is Angela Relogio and I uh, lead the group of systems biology of cancer here in Berlin um, and to get today together with uh, Janina Hesse, who is a postdoc at the group, we would like to tell you about some of the recent projects that we have been doing uh, regarding the circadian clock to show you that time matters and the kind of computational tools that can be used uh, to assess, access this time. So let me start by the acknowledgement. So I would like to thank, of course, our financing institute, um, our collaborators, who are many, and the group of systems biology of cancer that is here in Berlin. So this is actually a time clock. You can see the time from everywhere in the world if you come here to Alexanderplatz in Berlin. But we are in the process of moving to Hamburg to the medical school. So to give you a feeling of the outline, so I would like to start to tell you some basics on circadian clock, assuming that maybe the audience is not an expert on it, to go into the molecular network of the clock, talk a bit about the dysregulation of the circadian clock and its impact in health and disease. Uh, and then I will pass it out to Janina, who will tell you more about measuring circadian rhythms in humans. And she will show you also how mathematical modeling tools can help in assessing and in predicting uh, circadian time. So our lives are ruled by rhythms and time is very important. And we have times, I hope you can see my mouse here, and you have times where you are alert and you have times where you are sleeping. But even more than that, so within a 24 hours day, you have, for example, times where you are more alert, you have times where you are better to do sports, and so that this times happen and all these different situations happen, there are biological processes which are behind it, which need to happen at specific times. For example, certain hormones need to be produced. So here you have melatonin, which reaches its peak pretty much when you start sleeping. And the other way around, you have cortisol, which keeps you alert, which reaches its peak in the morning, which is when you are awake. And this times uh, they are given by our endogenous clock. And in our group, we care about the cellular clock. So we look at this clock uh, in terms of the cell. So if you imagine this as a cell with the nucleus and the cytoplasm around it, you have a netrodimer complex formed by the two proteins clock BMAL, which activate the transcription of four families here of target genes. Now these genes, if we follow this upper part of the network, they are translated, proteins are being made, these proteins come to the nucleus and there is here a fine tuning of this gene BMAL, which is formed by REV and OR, which have opposite effects. And then the protein is being made and this loop is closed. The <laughs> lower part, you have something similar. So you have the genes PER and CRY. They are, there is a translation of the mRNA uh, protein uh, complex is being formed, which goes to the nucleus and inhibits clock BMAL mediated transcription. So what you see here is a set of green and red, red lines. So activations and inhibitions, which form this kind of very closely interconnected loops. So if we look into more detail into one of these loops, imagine the protein BMAL which activates the gene PER, as I mentioned, which leads to a protein PER, and this protein inhibits BMAL transcription or BMAL mediated transcription. So how does this look like? So imagine we make a plot and we now want to plot time versus the amount of something which is being produced. So let's start with BMAL. So BMAL starts to be produced after a certain time, 
Then you have PER, which starts to be produced because it's activated by the email. And a little later, so with a certain delay, then you have the PER protein, which starts to be produced. Now, when this protein reaches a certain peak, it inhibits it inhibits BMAL transcription. And if it, this, uh, it inhibits the protein BMAL. And when this happens and BMAL is inhibited, then what happens is that the gene which is activated also gets down. And the same, the protein, which would be the result of that gene, would also go down. And when it goes down enough, then you have again another protein which is being released, which is BMAL, and the gene is more trans transcribed, and the protein is then more translated. And what you have here is a series of um, a series of waves which last exactly 24 hours. And this is the mechanism which makes time. And because of this mechanism, the three gentlemen here got in 2017 the Nobel Prize in Physiology or medicine. So everything is kind of rather recent. So not the mechanism itself, but uh, recognition that it's uh, important. So if we now focus on the behavior of PER over time, and we try to represent this mathematically. So imagine again, the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And now I want to find out how much do I have of this protein in time? So I want to see the variation of PER in time. I know it depends in a positive way with the amount of PER which is translated, in a negative way, of course, with the amount of PER which goes to the nucleus, because then it's not there, in a negative way with the amount of PER which is degraded. And with this, I have the equation for PER. Now I can do, of course, something similar, and I can represent my entire network, which I've shown you before. And this is just a little bit of it. Um, and this kind of mathematical model of differential equations produces, of course, sustained oscillations with the rhythms and the phases that we wish to see. So experimentally, because we also do experimental work in the group, we can visualize this sort of behavior by using a construct uh, which is represented here, where you see uh, the gene uh, luciferase, which is uh, controlled by uh, the circadian promoter of the gene we want to look at. So this is then um, placed inside the cells and the cells will uh, kind of make light when they react with the substance that we put in the medium. And this light is what we measure. <laughs> and so what you see here for this particular cell line, uh, the cells are alive and we measure them for a series of days. And you have in green, the curve for BMAL and in lila, the curve for PER. And I always find this really impressive because these genes are really expressed in a rhythmic manner and they have this antiphase relation here, which is very characteristic of a functioning clock. So not only in the cell lines, but you can also look at different tissues. So you have here for mouse tissues, heart, lung, liver, and so on. And what you have here are all the different core clock genes that I talked about, uh, their expression in terms of RNA over 24 hours. And as you can see, this varies a lot. So there is no flat line, but a lot of curves and they are very similar from tissue to tissue. Of course, you could now go at a transcriptome level and you could check all these different genes. So you, has here, you have here a phase clustered heat map where each column is a time point and each line is a gene. And I marked here some of the core clock genes. We could also look into detail by one of the genes and then check it at the RT-PCR level. And you see again, this variation within 24 hours. So we are very well aware that gene expression is not flat, but it's changing over 24 hours. So if we now go at the systems level, how is this circadian system organized? So it's a hierarchical system. You have a main clock in the brain in the structure of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is formed by a series of coupled neurons. So this is very uh, prone for modeling for coupled oscillators. But you have several preflow clocks so that pretty much every cell of your body has a clock. And what's very relevant, the central clocks and the preflow clocks, they are synchronized. Now, this isn't always the case. It could be that your clocks kind of run crazy, so to say. And this happens, for example, in the times before Corona, where we used to travel. And then we have something which is jet lag. And the reason why you feel bad is exactly that, because the clocks lose synchrony. So if we look at this now a little bit more in detail, so how does it work? What's the path that leads uh, to this sort of events? So imagine you receive um, a time cue from light. 
And this is called a Zeitgeber. A Zeitgeber is actually the German word which technically is used in the field. It means uh, literally a time giver. And this is any sort of external, um, external stimuli. Uh, which may affect your clock. So it could be the light, but it could also be food or it could be exercise. However, the light is a very strong side giver, which directly um, is received by this intrinsically uh, photo photosensitive retinal uh, ganglion cells. And it goes via the retinal hypothalamic tract to the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus here in the brain and then via hormones or via different cues from the um, sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system or even core body temperature, it will then be um, translated or it will be transmitted to all the different cells of your body. And this is the way all clocks, they are synchronized. So you can imagine during jet lag, if then light is food is not giving at the time where it usually should be, but you kind of wake up in the middle of the night and start eating and so on. So you get a big confusion here of your side givers. And so you don't feel very good with it. But as you can see very importantly, actually, uh, this uh, system affects um, several important and crucial uh, mechanisms or systems inside of body, which goes from the nervous to the cardiovascular to the metabolic system, immune system, proliferation, or even reproduction. And therefore, when something goes wrong in these clocks, if the time cues go wrong, and if the oscillations don't behave as they should, of course, we have the tendency to develop a series of disorders, which can be um, quite damaging. And uh, one of these disorders uh, are problems, for example, in cellular uh, proliferation. And this is partially what I'm showing you here. So if you look into more detail, and the reason why this happens is because you have something like 50% of your genes which go through a circadian, uh, which have a circadian expression. And these are the genes which are involved in such processes that go from cell cycle, but also DNA damage response. And this has an effect in terms of tumor suppression. And as I said, we are in the group very interested in the connection between clock and tumorogenesis mechanisms. And in addition, we also know from epidemiological studies that there is an increased occurrence of cancer in long-term shift workers. And we know from studies in cell and mouse models that mice deficient in PER2 um, they have a much higher tendency to develop cancer or high uh, mouse which are uh, subjected to chronic jet lag. So it is therefore no surprise that already in 2007, the World Health Organization actually decreed that shift work that involves circadian disruption is probably carcinogenic to humans. So um, one of the things which cancers have in common is that cancer cells undergo multiple stages of dissemination. So from the process of abnormal proliferation to proliferation in the form of a primary tumor, going through local invasion and intravasation into the blood vessels, dissemination across the bloodstream, extravasation in distal tissues, colonization, formation of micrometastasis, and finally proliferation and microscopic metastasis, all these processes, they seem to be ruled by what is called the hallmarks of cancer. And so cancer cells, they need to escape a series of uh, safekeeping mechanisms to allow for this cancer to develop. And this goes from resisting cell death to even escaping um, immune protection. Uh, so to avoid immune destruction, or uh, to activate invasion and metastasis. And what we know now from our work and work of others is that several, if not all of this process, they are timely regulated. And in the past years, we have been quite busy um, in trying to, to learn more about these processes. And so we focused on the, the um, connection between the cell cycle and proliferation, both in vitro models, as well as in vivo models, like here in zebrafish. We tried to explore a little bit more regarding metabolism and also how cells communicate with their environment in terms of circadian rhythms. We looked at the immune system and we looked a lot in terms of um, computational analysis at a more brighter systems level, but also using mathematical models to address this. So, 
what's kind of interesting and puzzling is we know actually by now a lot. And you see here um, a plot which is made out of PubMed publications. So red are publications which have the term circadian. So there is really quite a lot. And this has increased immensely in the last years. But now you see here in blue, this, this tiny thing in the background, which you can hardly see, these are publications where this knowledge was actually applied to some kind of therapy, maybe cancer or something else. And this is really very small. So we set up to try to, to work more on this, to use this kind of knowledge to apply to treatment, which does not necessarily need to be cancer. So what we know by now is that there are more than 50% of drugs which are FDA approved and target genes that oscillate. But this knowledge isn't really being used. And we wanted to start to make use of that. And so we started to design a tool to assess and to monitor circadian rhythms. And what we do is that we collect uh, RNA from saliva, actually, so totally non-invasive at different times of the day. We process this in the lab, so we quantify the RNA, and then we use different types of mathematical models to quantify and to extrapolate information from it. And our idea for that would be to extract an information which goes from give you indications regarding sleep, meals, exercise, or best time for treatment. And if we look now at uh, real data, which we have recently made, it's not yet uh, published, it's under revision. Uh, we have here a series of uh, healthy volunteers who participated. And what you see in each of these plots are um, experimental data, which are the dots. And this is across two days. And in the uh, Y axis, what you see are the, is the amount of RNA. So the relative amount that was measured. And you have here two genes, the BMAL gene and the PER. And you see how different all these different people are. And there are actually some reasons for it, which I'm not going into it right now. Um, but what I would like uh, to, to leave you here now with the impression is that, as you see, uh, they may be very different, but they all tend to have this kind of oscillation. And so this is quite relevant. And um, what we wanted now to find out is what are the kind of methods that we can use to explore this sort of data and to obtain more information out of it so that we can, in principle, at some point, apply this eventually to therapy. And I will pass it on now uh, to Janina, who will go into more details in the type of models that we are using to analyze this. Let's have a closer look at this uh, pipeline here. Sampling, what we do is that we actually sample some kind of biological tissue several times a day. And that gives us a time series which can be either genes or also some physiological um, measure, such as hormones or temperature. And this time series is then analyzed in a computational analysis. This analysis will give us circadian time on one hand. And on the other hand, this combined thing will then be uh, used to predict optimal time for behavior. And I will exemplify this at two examples. One of them is the cancer drug and the other one is sports, so exercise performance. What exactly now is circadian time? Let's try a proper definition. What you see here is a human that is kept in dark for the whole time of several days. And Sleep and wake cycles actually continue even if you keep the human in dark, but they will shift from day to day a little bit. And the reason for that is that the period of this intrinsic oscillation of awake and sleep phases actually has a period that is a bit longer than um, it's a local model. And so, yeah, therefore, can... this shift arises. Yeah, then... Now, if we are under normal conditions, so in a day with light during the day and darkness during the night, zeitgebers, especially the light itself, shift our wake and sleep phases such that they align from day to day more or less. So light shifts in the morning, the sleep phase to an earlier 
phase. And what you probably all know is that also something like caffeine is a strong side giver, because if you drink it in the evening, sleep onset might occur a bit later. Now, in combination, the genetic properties, your own genetic setup, as well as your environment, lead to individual sleep and wake patterns for different people. You might know somebody who is rather a morning like, others are night owls. And this is exactly the difference in circadian time that underlies this. In order to access circadian time differences, one of the gold standards is to measure melatonin. You have already heard this is the sleep hormone that rises in the evening and is very strong during the night. And by measuring every hour this hormonal level, you can actually see at what time a certain threshold is crossed. And the time associated with the threshold crossing is what we assume as circadian time. Now with these me hourly measurements, the measurement of, as it's called, dim light melatonin onset is quite cumbersome. So in alternative, people have used different measures which show circadian rhythmicity and are hence potentially useful to predict circadian time. The easiest or potentially easiest is to use questionnaires and to ask people about their sleep and wake habits. And these questionnaires then give you a rather rough categorization in morning types, intermediate types and evening types, for example. Another approach is to use behavioral measures. So this is a recording, a constant recording of your activity level or of the light that you are exposed to. And also these can be used to predict your circadian time. Then there is the physiological measurements as body core temperature and the hormonal levels via molecular methods such as melatonin, just shown in the last slide, or also cortisol mentioned in the beginning. And last but not least, we have the gene expression. And gene expression is actually what we are going to focus on for the rest of the talk because of the following reasons. The first two questionnaires and the behavioral, so light exposure or activity levels, they depend quite strongly on your lifestyle. And especially if you think about patients who are bedridden, they might not be the optimal way to access circadian time. Physiological measures and hormonal levels are much more robust, but here with every single measurement, so for each time point, you only get a single measure. So the information content per time point is rather low. In contrast, gene expression data has a very high information content because you can measure multiple genes simultaneously. And on top of that, Gene expression is actually at the basis of anything that happens in your body. So we believe that this is particularly biological relevant because it induces all the processes. Once you have your sample collected, you can put, or especially now the genes, once you have them collected, uh, the computational analysis consists of three different steps, circadian rhythmicity analysis, machine learning, and model fitting whereas the machine learning and the model fitting are two alternatives that can also be combined, but don't have to be combined. But the first step in um, estimating the circadian time is the rhythmicity analysis. So basically we are interested in whether or not the gene is oscillating, so shows the circadian rhythmicity. For that, you basically take the experimental measurements, here are the dots, and you try to fit a curve, a periodic curve with a period of about 24 hours to this gene expression data. And if that is possible, if you are successful with the fit, you consider this gene as having a circadian rhythmicity. And all the genes that have a circadian rhythmicity are potentially interesting for assessing circadian time. So from all the genes that we can potentially measure, these are the ones that we are focusing on. 
And these are the ones that are then put into, for example, a machine learning algorithm. So what you give to the machine learning in order to set up the algorithm is on the one hand a sample. So these different genes, for example, time series with the different gene values on top, as well as a well-established measure of circadian time. To first of all, train the machine learning. So in these two publications, this was, for example, done by melatonin, dim light melatonin onset. So this gold standard explained a couple of slides before. Having these samples, as well as the associated circadian time on a personal level, allows then the machine learning to relate the two and presented with new samples, predict the circadian time for these new samples. The disadvantage of machine learning is that the algorithm, once it is trained, is kind of a black box. We do not exactly know what is going on there. And hence, we believe that modeling is a very interesting approach to get rid of this black box. In this case, the black box, so to say, is filled with biological facts based on experimental data. So we have a transcription translation network, as shown in the beginning of the talk, that is actually fitted to subjects and to their circadian time, and then used to predict circadian time. So the question that once you have, so in the literature, actually, most people use these approaches to predict circadian time. But what we are actually after is something like a question, when is the optimal circadian time to take medication? Or when is the optimal time to eat your meals, take a nap, or do sports? And we believe that actually the more appropriate question is not so much asking after the circadian time, but to ask, when is your body ready? And the reasoning for that is as follows. We actually start out with the sampling with complex biological data a so-called circadian profile, a time series of measurements. And we want at the end to predict something about a complex behavior, such as exercise. And the normal way is now to predict, based on the complex biological data, circadian time, which is just a single value, so a very simple measure, and to go then from that back to the complex behavior. We believe that a more straightforward way is to just get rid of this estimation of circadian time and directly go from the complex biological data to a complex behavior in order to enhance the information content available for the prediction associated with the timing of the behavior. I would like to show you what exactly we mean with that with two examples. The first of all is cancer medication toxicity. Our example is the colon cancer drug irinotecan, which is regulated by the core clock. And interestingly, giving the drug actually also influences the core clock. So it also works the other way around. And here, a modeling approach is particularly promising because this kind of feedback cannot easily be implemented into a machine learning approach. This project is current co-work with Julia Martinelle and Annabelle Ballester from the Institut Curie in Paris. And the basic idea of the project is that we combine two transcriptional translation networks. One, which is related to the cancer medication itself, and the other one, which models the core clock. So these complex networks have connections really on the gene basis. And by implementing them into the models, we can get one big model, which can then be used to really fit the model to individual patients and predict drug toxicity based on this individual person. The second example that I would like to go through is more related to machine learning. So this is a quite large project, then I would like to give first a short overview and then go into two details. So in this project, we were measuring diurnal gene expression with three different methods, blood, saliva, and hair. And we then decided to focus on saliva because this is the only measure which is really non-invasive. Saliva measurement consists of a sample collection four times a day, 
and then mRNA extraction via quantitative um, polymerase chain reaction in order to get the circadian expression profiles of some genes of interest. On the other hand, the same people of whom we measured the diurnal gene expression perform diurnal behavioral measures. On the one hand, they were doing exercises and we measured performance of these exercises. On the other hand, uh, we measured muscle tone, which is a measure of muscle strength. In what follows, I'm going to focus on the exercise performance. Let's first have a look at the saliva gene expression data. So as I said, the, the saliva was sampled four times a day and actually two days in a row. And we get from that these kind of plots with the experimental data in dots and the fitted line as a line. And at the example of BMAL, the blue line here, you can see that there are really differences between participants. This participant here, participant 17, shows a later peak of BMAL1 compared to participant 5, which shows an earlier peak. And these kind of differences will be useful in what follows. On the level of the exercises, so the behavioral assessment, we had uh, training sessions that, or exercise sessions that actually were consisting of a warm up of 15 minutes and then a hand strength test. So people were holding a device and were pushing as strongly as possible in order to measure the force that they can exert with their hand. So this is the measure of strength. Next, they perform the counter movement jump. The counter movement jump um, is a jump that is performed on top of a force measurement platform so that the force that the jump creates can be directly measured. Again, this is a strength measurement, but we realize that it's also quite dependent on technique. How exactly your jump makes a difference in the results. And last but not least, these participants performed the shuttle run test which is a timed running test, which tests for endurance. And these tests were done at four different times of the day, though at different days in order to prevent fatigue effects. The data that results from these tests look like this. So we have the hand strength test in blue, the three repetitions for each individual time point during the day and um, in orange the counter movement jump just to show two examples. This data here is normalized to the mean peak time to make the things comparable. So this kind of data is now often used in literature in order to lump together all the different participants and come up with the result that peak performance can be observed somewhat in the late afternoon. This is known from the literature and we can actually confirm this result. We are, however, more interested in individual peak performance times. And already here for the same persons, you see that the peak performance actually depends also on the test that you're doing. The second measure that we are interested in is the amount of diurnal variation that you can observe. In this example, for example, the uh, counter movement jump has a stronger diurnal variation compared to the hand strength test. And the ultimate goal is to ask whether we can actually predict based solely on the gene expression data, how the peak time of performance and the diurnal variation in exercise performance, um, how strong they are. We seem to be able to do that. However, this is a preliminary analysis based on only 10 participants and more participants will be needed in order to confirm our results properly. The first thing that we observed was a correlation between the peak time of the gene PER2 
and the peak time of the hand strength test. So here we are, relate, we are relating a genetic measure with an exercise measure. And based on this correlation, we can already attempt a very simple prediction by simply saying, okay, what we predict is that a person with an early PER2 peak also shows an early peak for the hand strength test. And the person with a late PER2 peak shows a late peak in the hand strength test. So this blue and this green box. And by this simple prediction, we can correctly classify nine out of 10 participants. And there's only this one prediction here, which is wrong because an early per two peak here relates to a late hand strength test peak. In order to see whether we can get even better, we used a support vector machine. A support vector machine gets as input the different time points of our gene expression time series. And it also gets a label associated with that. So an early or a late hand strength test performance. We just distinguish early and late, not the four different time points to make it easier for the support vector machine. So you can imagine that these red dots are early sports performances and the blue dots are late sport performances performance peaks. And what the machine learning then does is that in the space of the time series, so to say, so of the gene, gene expression data, it finds a hyperplane that optimally separates the two different labels that we gave based on the sports performance in such a way that the distance to the nearest labeled points is maximized. And by using such a linear support vector machine, we can predict early versus late hand strength test peaks based now, if we just use the information on the peak perform a peak gene expression of per two with an accuracy of 80%, so eight out of 10 correct predictions. And if we use the mean normalized per two time series, so every measurement of per two that we have, we actually can improve the prediction accuracy to 100%. So all the predictions correct. This is based on a um, leave one out cross validation. After we have now more or less successfully predicted the peak of the sports performance, we next would like to evaluate the exercise variation. So how strongly does somebody vary throughout the day? And for that, we introduce performance change, a measure which is simply the maximum versus the minimum of the sports performance divided by the minimum. So it's in percent, how much larger is the maximum compared to the minimum? And we have here, and actually, in accordance with the um, literature, we find about 10% of variation in these different sport tests when you look at the mean. But again, looking at individual participants, you can see that there's quite some variation around this mean value of 10%. Here for the hand strength test, for example, the person with the least variation shows 3% variation. The maximum is at 17%. Now I have covered these different participants based on their gene expression. Green relates to an early BMAL1 gene expression and blue relates to a late BMAL1 expression. So the peak of the BMAL1 gene expression occurs either early, green or late in blue. And this simple distinction based on the gene expression actually quite nicely separates people with a high variation, so a high performance change from people with a low performance change. And again, we can use this in a very simplified prediction step and say, okay, from what we just observed, it seems that an early BMAL1 peak time actually relates to a quite strong change in the performance throughout the day. 
whereas a late BYL1 peak time relates to a small sport change. And by defining small exercise change and large exercise change simply as the top 50% and the bottom 50%, we again can um, predict correctly nine out of 10 participants with one wrong prediction. Now this performance change actually also includes all the different repetitions that the participants performed. So in order to um, identify the actual source, whether it's a circadian variation or just a noise due to the repetitions, we came up with a more elaborate measure of change throughout the day. So the overall variation can be measured either directly as this percentage change, or we can you look at the standard deviation based on all the different measurements that were done. Four time points, three repetition per time point. And the standard deviation based on this measurement is plotted here in this first column. And you can see that indeed people with an early BMAL1 peak show a higher standard deviation compared to people with a late BMAL1 peak here. Next, we were interested in is that really resulting from a diurnal variation? And for that, we calculated the standard deviation just based on the mean for each time point. And yeah, indeed, also here, we find a significant difference between early and late BMAL1 peak participants. And last, we checked whether the standard deviation calculated based solely on the repetitions for each time point individually would also show a significant difference. And in this case, we don't find a significant difference. And the, the interpretation is now that what we observe here, this relation between um, the gene BMR1 peak and the amount of change throughout the day in the sports performance is really due to some diurnal variation and not only due to a noise that is introduced by repeating the measurement at the same time point. We repeated the same analysis based on the hand strength test and the counter movement jump combined. And we also saw that significant differences occur for low mean BMAL1 levels compared to high BMAL1 levels. So instead of looking at the peak time, we now just look at the mean expression level, the temporal mean of BMAL1. And that this also shows a significant relation to the standard deviation, so the change in sports performance over the day, is explained by a finding that actually a low BMAL1 here in green, a low mean BMAL1 level, tends to have an earlier peak time compared to a high BMAL1 level, which tends to peak later throughout the day. This low and high BMAL1 level and the association, association that we find with the variation in sports performance is quite interesting with respect to this observation from the literature that higher levels of BMAL1 actually occur in professional sportsmen or women compared to amateurs. So we can confirm this finding by separating our participants into professionals, such as um, sports trainer or professional sport boxers versus amateurs, which do sports on a hobby basis, but are active. And we find that here, what is plotted are all the eight different time points of BMAL1. And indeed, we find that the overall level of BMAL1 is higher in the professionals compared to the amateurs. In our particular case, our amateurs consist mostly of females. So we can actually reinterpret the data by just shifting these two persons, these two amateurs, which are male, to the male category, and also find a significant difference between males and females. 
So males show higher levels of BMAL1 compared to females. Now, which of these are more relevant must be shown by a larger cohort of participants. But it's interesting that professionals seem to, if our prediction is correct, show smaller variations in sports performance compared to amateurs. With that, I would like to summarize what you have seen now. So first of all, we all have a circadian clock, which generates rhythms that rule our life. Underlying to these rhythms is a molecular clock network, which by a feedback loop of genes and proteins creates a period of about 24 hours. A dysregulation of the circadian clock has a strong impact on health and disease. The example we have shown was in particular cancer. And in order to help these patients or also normal people to improve their health, we have to measure circadian rhythms. And in order to measure them, Mathematical modeling can be used in order to assess and predict the time, in particular for more complicated measures. So directly melatonin is fine, but when you measure something else, a mathematical model might help. So basically, we are taking advantage of the daily rhythm by sampling at different time points biological tissue, which is then fed into a computational analysis, which considers the rhythmicity of the sample under question and uses machine learning and fitted models in order to come up with a personalized circadian phenotype, which then also implies treatment timing or best performance times or, or, or. There are different options what we could do with that then. So thank you very much. It is a great opportunity to present here our re research. Thank you for the invitation. And we are right now moving to Hamburg and we're looking forward to see you there once we are settled. Thank you very much for your attention and um, yeah, I'm welcoming questions. Thanks so much for this lovely presentation. Um, do we have any questions for Angela and Janina? I'm just checking the chat and there seem to be no questions in the chat yet. So if there are no questions, I actually have a few. Um, so one thing I actually want to ask you, you do these saliva tests every, uh, four times in a day. Is that right? Yes. Great. Um, since they're non-invasive, why are they done so spaced out in time? Would it be possible to do them more frequently to get like a better measure for the exact um, timings of the peaks of the B mile per two and so on. No, so actually, actually no, because um, mm -hmm. when when people do the saliva sampling, they have to be, for example, one hour before they should not eat, uh -huh, or yes. they they cannot brush their teeth immediately before so if you if you would do this every hour then you would have a hard time okay great that's good to know and <laughs> other thing i feel you've kind of a little bit answering my question but i wanted to ask you so you showed all these lovely experiments with people um doing all these physical physical exercises and um testing out their strength and so forth and the thing I was going to ask you, are they on any sort of special diet or do they have to follow special sleep? Like, are they somehow entrained or do you somehow keep track of their lifestyle choices or is, is that not relevant? Uh, so, yes, we keep track of their lifetime um, during the time of the, of the sampling and during the time of the exercise. So for this particular project, uh, they sample before and they have instructions what they should do uh, or they should not do and they also tell us uh, at which time have they taken their meals or at which time would they um, wake up or go to bed on that day and during the sports day it's also similar so we, we tell all participants that they should keep a similar diet but we don't tell them exactly what they should eat so we rather tell them what they shouldn't do 
aha, okay, that's great. And um, I actually have one more question that's come through the chat. So I've, the question is the following. Uh, do weather and lighting conditions during the measurements have any influence? Yes, of course. Um, and that makes also quite a difference. Uh, if, you, if you do sports or if you are an athlete, you will see that across seasons, you will have different performances. So in this particular case, uh, all measurements were done inside with artificial light. So we had a big uh, sports um, room. Um, so the light conditions for our particular case were similar, but the outside conditions were, of course, not similar depending on the time of the day. Um, but what we tried to do was we kept um, all the experiments or all the exercises were done during the same season. So that was important for us. So everything happened within one and a half months. Ah, okay. That's great. We have one more question that's come up and that's, do people eventually adjust to night shifts or is it always suboptimal? It's always suboptimal. So, <laughs> I mean, if you, if you have to do it, you do it. And if it's, it's just a few years, maybe it's not too bad. But what was shown from several studies is that if you do this across several years, so say several years means like 15, 20 years or so, then you may really have a problem. You have something like a kind of a chronic jet lag. So what's also interesting is this is similar to what happens to teenagers. So those of you, you may deal with teenagers at the moment, you know that they have a problem to wake up early during the weeks, while on the weekends, they always wake up much later. So they are constantly in jet lag. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one more question that's coming here. And so I'll read this one out. Uh, females have different mechanisms from male. Is there any relationship between circadian rhythm and females period menstruation? Yeah, okay. So um, in our case, we actually uh, checked that during the time that sampling was done or the sports were done, uh, it was not this time of the month. Yes, it does influence. So if you follow a female, across a month, you will detect some sort of a, noise is not the right word. So you, you detect some sort of a variation during the time of the month when females have the period. Um, and this is, this is one of the risks of so females, they have different uh, cycles in addition to males, right? So, and this is also one of the reasons why mostly if you do experiments in the lab, people tend to use mouse males because it's simpler you have much less complexity to address to. This is one of the issues, yeah. Great, and I think we'll finish with just this one last question we have. If you could sample X times a day, what is the right time interval to choose representative time for these measurements? So we actually tested um, this sort of situations um, by using, so when we look at cell lines, Yes, so when we take samples from cell lines via RT-PCR, we usually extract like every three hours continuously over 48 hours. So this gives you much more time points, the more time points you have. You also probably know as mathematicians, the better you can fit the curve, the better you can fit your models. Now, this is not realistic for people. So um, we still have decent p-values if we go to sampling intervals, which go around four hours. If we start sampling every six hours, then it starts to be quite bad. So we try not to go below four hours. That's great. Thank you both so much, Angela and Janina, for this wonderful talk. And yeah, we don't have any more questions, I think. We're just getting lots of thanks through the Zoom chat. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.